you have a Bible, you're going to want to turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the first 11 verses. And you can turn there and just keep it open because we're going to kind of go back to that <clears throat> throughout the uh, message today. Uh, Philippians is a small book in the New Testament written by Paul to the church at Philippi. Um, so if you get to Genesis, just keep going a little ways and uh, you'll get there. Don't be ashamed if you have to go to the table of contents. That's okay too. That's what it's there for. And if you're uh, using the Pew Bible, I think in your uh, program, there's a page number there. <clears throat> so I, I thought I would uh, open up this morning with just some helpful information about Thanksgiving. Um, in 2017, the uh, Americans ate <clears throat> 45 million turkeys over Thanksgiving. That's according to an estimate by the National Turkey Federation. Anybody know if we had a National Turkey Federation? Yeah, they advocate for turkey farmers. So hey, the, the, the National Turkey Federation does something uh, helpful for our turkey farmers. So Thanksgiving, as you know, Thanksgiving dinner or lunch or breakfast or whatever you eat it is, is not always kind uh, to the waistline. Um, a typical Thanksgiving meal, just typical with appetizers, main dishes, side dishes, maybe a slice of pecan pie or something, which is my favorite, by the way, a uh, typical meal has about 3,150 calories and about 159 grams of fat. Does anyone know what the recommended daily calorie amount is? What? Yeah, yeah. It, I wish it was 5,000, but it's 2,000. Yeah, it's about 2,000. And so it says me, th this, I was looking it up. It was, it was online, so it's got to be true. Um, so uh, it says the typical... A typical American will eat more than 4,500 calories in the entire day on Thanksgiving. Um, and so, it's like, wow. So here's what I recommend, okay? This is what I recommend, is that you go to Walmart, and you buy some sweatpants with the elastic waistband, and just wear those suckers all day, and you're good to go. That's just my advice to you. And this is, this is how the sequence of events usually go on Thanksgiving. Um, so you're, you're, you're eagerly... Um, you're awaiting, as for me, like I'm eagerly awaiting uh, the food to be ready because I, I'm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consume massive quantities of food. And I'll fill my plate uh, till, it over, till you know, it's kind of falling off. And I'll eat more than I normally ever do any other day of the year and, and probably eat on that day more than, than any human should. And after about the second or third piece of, of pie, I'll, I'll push away from the table. And to no one's surprise... What I'll do is I'll announce that I'm stuffed. I'm stuffed. And so, if possible, you, you know, we'll get up from the table and you'll make your way to the couch. Now, I don't know about you. You may have never done this in your life, but I've done this um, more times than, than, than I, I would like to admit. But I've eaten so much that, like, I literally, I, I just need to, to lay down. Because I've, I've eaten so much, and it's just like, this is the only position that really feels good. And, you know, it's just, it's just so, you're just miserable. It's like, you know, you've been there a while, you, you, you had a great time, and then all of a sudden, you're just, you're miserable. And, and uh, we, we, I, mean, I do it, we do it every year, and we, but we think, and, and by the way, just so you know, I'm not being critical or judgmental of you. That's, that's me, and I'll just go ahead and confess I'm, I'm going to do it again this year. But um, anyway, so stuffing, stuffing ourselves with food is, is a pretty good illustration of how most Americans or most, most of us live our lives. We live our lives. We're, we're busy trying to stuff our lives with stuff because we want to make sure that we have enough stuff or we have the right kind of stuff or at least as much stuff as, as uh, uh, or the same kinds of stuff as, as everyone else around us. We, we end up getting stuffed with debt. Uh, we stuff our calendars with, with overcommitment. We uh, stuff our kids' schedules because they need to be busy because uh, you know, the, everyone else's kids seem to be involved in a lot of stuff. Uh, we, we stuff our closets, we stuff our garages, we stuff our homes, um, we stuff ourselves with social media, we stuff ourselves with entertainment, we stuff ourselves until we are literally quite 
miserable because we just have too much stuff. Or we don't have the right stuff. Or we're so overbooked with stuff that we're just miserable. And, and being stuffed, it, it causes anxiety in our life. It causes worry. It causes stress. Um, sometimes if we look at all our stuff and we don't think it's the right stuff, then it will cause us to have low self-esteem. It causes all kinds of not-so-fun things in our life. It seems like it does, kind of like Thanksgiving eating. It seems like it's all good and fun, but then afterwards, it, sometimes we're just, we're just miserable. And, and, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not just talking about, um, when I say stuff, I'm not just talking about the, the things that you go and you buy. Uh, but that's definitely, that's definitely part of it, but it's not all of it. I'm talking about a life that really becomes consumed with self. Just living for self, making sure you, you look good to the rest of the world, making sure that you appear to have it all together, um, making sure that you have the right stuff, making sure that your kids are all in the right activities and, and, and making the good grades, and if they're not, we're going to really stress them out. Um, just, just making sure that... that that your house is big as everyone, are, but may, the whole idea is that the, your main focus is you and how you look to other people or, or when, how you compare to other people. And a life that is consumed with self is often lived that way because that's where you find security, that's where you find purpose, and that's where you find meaning. You find that in, in being stuffed. And, and here's a key question that I think you have to ask yourself when we're talking about stuff. How do, you, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a funnel or do you see yourself as a fence? If you're taking notes, that's, that's the first blank on your outline. Do you see yourself as a funnel or do you see yourself as a fence? Uh, this is a funnel, right? I don't, have a, I don't have a fence up here, so you'll have to use your imagination. Uh, but, but basically, fences, fences divide, define property lines. Fences keep things in or, or, or keep things out. And funnels um, are, are used to, to, to channel something or, or pour something into something else. So for our purposes today here, um, here's, here's what I want you to think. If you're a fence, then you're just worried about you. But if you're a funnel, then you realize that your purpose in life is to use your life to pour into others. It's, it's a phrase that if you've kind of grown up in church or, or been around church much, it's a phrase that you've heard a lot. It, it, it's called blessed, blessed to be a blessing. Fence people, uh, fence people kind of live with the idea that I'm, I'm blessed, but, but uh, how do I get more? Um, I'm blessed, but, you know, I, I need more, or I need, that, that's not right, I need more of that, or, or I just need more. Funnel people say that I'm blessed, and then so how do, I, how do I pass this on to others? And if you find purpose, if you find your purpose and security and your value and being stuffed, then you're going to build a, just a big old fence around your life. But if you find your purpose, if you find your security, if you found your value in Christ, then you'll be looking for opportunities to pour out your life so that others can benefit from your life and, and, and benefit from your stuff. Uh, so let's, let's read Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11. It says this, it says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, and by the way, when, it, when, when the Bible here, when it's saying if, I, what I want you to think, because in the original language, the, the word there should be since. So you can read it there. Since there is any encouragement in Christ, since any consolation of love, since if any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection, make my joy. So it's saying, since those are real, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Now, you have to remember, Paul is writing this to the church, to Christians, to believers, to new believers uh, in, in Philippi. 
And so he's addressing something that's been going on. So apparently there hasn't been, there's been struggles with unity. There's been struggles with humility. So do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Verse 4, everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus was a funnel. Um, I think it's safe to say that he was a funnel. He was not, he was not a fence builder. And, and so if Jesus was a funnel, then as Christ followers, it's, it's, it's a pretty safe bet that we need to be funnels. So what I want to do today, just in the time that we have left, is I want to tell you what, it, what does funnel, funnel living look like. So if, if we're called to be this, what, what does that look like? And there's some qualities. And the first quality of, of, of funnel living is a concern for others goes before a concern for self. A concern for others goes before a concern for self. Verse 3 there, we just read, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. It's not that you don't take care of yourself, but yourself is not your only concern. It's the, it's, it's the idea of being full of self versus being selfless. It's, it's an attention on others. It's on, 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 you, you're paying attention to others on their strengths, their virtues. That, that's really what, what Christian humility is in, in, at its finest. In a word, when it's talking about humility here, the, the, the word you need to think of is love. Its root is found in love. Now, there is this negative sense of humility. Negative humility focuses on, on yourself, and you focus on your inadequacies. Like, well, I'm not this, or I'm not this, or I'm not this. And that's, that's, that's negative humility, and that's not what we're talking about. Positive Christian humility is motivated by a love and a focus on others. Romans 12.10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. The idea here is, is that we understand that every individual is a creation of God with unique giftings, with unique talents and abilities, and it's all motivated by love. It's not because they're better than us, so that's why we should be, we're, we're, you know, that's humility. They, we're, they're better than us, so they should. It's not because they're more beautiful or more handsome than us. It's not because they're wealthier than us. It's not because they're, they're any more important than us. It has actually nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the idea that we're all created by God, and God has called us to live our lives loving Him and loving others. Can you imagine a world or, or just a, a, a city, Allen, um, or a church, FBC Allen, where everyone's biggest argument is who's going to serve who first? Imagine a family who's, who's able to sit down at the dinner table and not talk about how stressed they are or how overbooked their calendars are or how... How, how crazy life is, but is instead trying to figure out how to maybe serve a family that lives in their neighborhood or trying to put on the calendar, hey, how can we, how can we uh, open our home uh, to someone for a meal? Imagine a marriage where, where the husband and, and the wife are so committed not only to their marriage, but, but committed to, to other people's marriages and, and helping people uh, grow strong in their marriages by, by figuring out how they can maybe mentor other couples. Imagine an individual who, who isn't satisfied with just filling themselves up with, with God's Word, but, but are so interested in applying God's Word so that they can know how their life can benefit someone else. Funnel living um, is, is impossible if you always insist on being the center of your universe. Another quality of, of funnel living is, is having a wide view of life that makes room for others. 
You, you have this wide view of life that, that's going to make room for others. Verse 4 says, Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And, and the Greek word for the phrase there, look, to, to look out for, it's, it's skapeo, which means to notice. Just, just to notice. And, and maybe, have you ever seen uh, this person, and this might be you, so I apologize if this is you, but I, I don't necessarily mean to point you out, but... Typically, someone who's on their phone in, in kind of a public area, and they've, they've either got the headphones in or they've got the earbuds, pods. I forget what they're called. Uh, sorry. Um, but, but they've got it, and they're on the phone, and, and they're, they're talking, like, really loud. Um, you might see this. Um, like, I, I just I noticed this the other day when we were coming in Guatemala on, uh, on the airplane or, you know, you're sitting in a waiting room or, or maybe in a restaurant, and, and they're just... They're, they're just unaware, but they're having this loud conversation, and, and, and it can get a little bit of, a little bit of an annoying, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm always worried, too, because I don't want to think, I don't want to be sensitive Jimmy, you know, or whatever, easily offended Jimmy, so I kind of look around, and, and I see that everyone else is kind of looking at this person, and it, it, it's like, we, you kind of want to just go, uh, excuse me, you know, I, I enjoy your conversation. We just all don't want to be a part of it, you know, and it's that kind of thing. And it's, but, but basically everyone else is, is noticing. Everyone else is aware except the person who is completely unaware of how loud they're, and I'm not saying don't talk on your phone because I'm sure these are important conversations, but it's, it's, it's almost like, hey, just, just drop it down to, to where everyone else is. But everyone seems to be aware of what's happening except that one person and it's it's kind of the way that that, that we when, when you when you're a fence living you you're completely unaware of what's going on you, you're just busy taking care of you you're concerned with you basically you're saying I, I don't really have room I don't have room for anything else in my life right now but funnel living m- means that your head is up your eyes are open, and you, you're noticing the world around you. And you. You don't get so caught up in you. You aren't consumed with you, and you understand that the world is bigger than you and that, and that there are people around you who need you. But it's hard, it's hard to, to be that way when, when you don't notice the world around you. 1 John 3, 17 says, but whoever has the world's goods, adequate resources, and sees his brother in need but has no compassion for him, how does the love of God live in him? You know, um, well, you've, I don't know if this ever happened to you, maybe it's just me, but you, you, you can see something, but you don't really notice it. I mean, you're looking at it. I hope that makes sense. You're looking at it, but you don't, you're not really paying attention, or it's almost like it's in your field of vision, but you just, you're kind of seeing, you're seeing past it. And I, and I think that's, when we read this verse in 1 John, I think that's a little bit of what's happening, is, is you see the need, but you're just not really paying attention, or you're just so unaware that, that it doesn't move you. You just kind of look past it, and you're not moved by it because you're just you're not you're not noticing it and if the love of god is in you then then you can't help but be you can't help but be a funnel you can't help but but notice things it's 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 not loving it's not christ like it's uh, it, it's it's not how you were made to just stuff yourself to just be so unaware to not have room for anything or anyone else uh, in your life stuffing yourself means that you're not noticing how your stuffing is affecting others like the uh, again just to use the phone example the person on the phone is completely unaware of how that conversation is making others feel that it's too loud that it's a little they're just they're just in their world Stuffing yourself means you're not noticing that your stuffing is making you miss opportunities to help others. Stuffing yourself means you're not noticing how your stuffing you is hurting maybe your marriage or maybe hurting your kids, hurting your walk with Christ, hurting your witness, hurting friendships, or maybe even hurting 
yourself. You see, you, you can't make room for others if you're taking up the entire space. You can't, others can't join you on the couch if you're just laying across the whole thing totally unaware of everyone else around you. Another quality of, of funnel living is, is having an attitude that mirrors the attitude of Christ, the, the attitude of Jesus. And his attitude was to empty himself. We have to empty ourselves. Verse 5, it says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. And the idea is that Jesus, in coming to earth, he didn't, he didn't cease to be God or he didn't become a, a lesser God. Uh, as one commentary put it, it's better to think of Christ emptying himself as laying aside the privileges of, of heaven, the, the, the privileges that were his in heaven. Rather than stay on his throne in heaven, Jesus made himself nothing. And when he came to earth, he gave up those divine privileges. He veiled his glory. He chose to occupy the position of a slave. You see, and Jesus didn't have to, but, but he chose to. He wanted to do what was right. He could have claimed his rights as God, but he was willing to let go of his rights so that you and I could be right with God. Jesus' attitude was full of love for his Father, and it was full of love for you and, and for me, and, and that's why he was willing to empty himself. That was his attitude, and that should be our attitude. 1 John 2, verse 6 says, If we say we are his, we must what? Follow the example of Christ. Read that verse with me. Here we go. If we say we are his, we must follow the example of Christ. We can't empty ourselves if we're full of ourselves. To belong to Christ means that we aren't saying things like, I deserve this. I earn this. This is my right. This is my stuff. This is my life. That wasn't the example that Jesus gave us. Um, I don't know if you were, some of you are familiar with, with Scripture and familiar with the life of Christ, but there was a, on, on the night before Jesus was actually going to be crucified, um, he spent some time with his closest followers, with his disciples. Um, and they went to this room, this, this house that was a place that he had prepared, um, and they went to share this meal. And as they're eating or as they're, they're talking, getting ready to eat, Jesus notices something. He notices that, that no one's feet have been washed. And this was, this was customary in, in, in Jesus' time because they're walking everywhere they go. And when they're walking, they're not walking, walking on pavement. Uh, they're walking on dirt. They're walking in mud. They're walking in filth. Uh, because, you know, the same roads they use, animals use. Um, there wasn't plumbing uh, in Jesus' time. So basically, you're just kind of walking in blech. And, so, and you're walking in sandals or, or you're walking in bare feet. And so as it's customary um, for the host to wash uh, people's feet, um, and it wasn't necessarily the host, but it was a servant of the host, um, and this was probably foot washing, was probably not high on the servant, uh, the highest servant in the home, it was probably left for maybe the lowest servants, and Jesus, Jesus notices that everyone's feet are still dirty, and what's interesting is when he notices this, if you read that passage in John, it says all, all power in heaven on earth had been given to him. And it was in that moment when, as God, all heaven, you know, all power given to him, what's interesting to me is he chose to stand up, he chose to take off his outer robe, he chose to put on a towel and wash the disciples' feet. He could have said, I deserve to have my feet washed. And you know what? If he would have said that, he would have been absolutely right. He could have said, after all that I have done for you guys, and uh, and." And after what I'm about to do for you guys, I deserve to have my feet washed. And he would have been right. He could have said, you are my people. I'm your leader. I'm, I'm, your, I'm your shepherd. I'm your rabbi. I am your God. I should have my feet. I deserve to have my feet washed. And he would have been absolutely right to say that. But Jesus, 
He wasn't concerned with being right. He was consumed with love. And he wanted to give us an example to follow. He wanted to give us an example to follow. Luke 9, 23 through 25 says, Then he said to the crowd, this is Jesus talking, Tell me if this is, sounds like you're demanding your rights. If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you're trying to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake... You will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? Stuffing yourself is the exact opposite of what we just read in Luke 9, 23 through 25. Being consumed with self is not the way to follow Christ. Think about trick-or-treaters. That was just last month, Halloween. Some of you may still be munching on that Halloween candy. Um, But you know how this works. You go door-to-door with a bag, or if you're a teenager, with a pillowcase. And what you do is you go to -to door-to-door, and you say, fill it. Just fill it. And as stuffers... That's how we approach life. We go to, we go to our jobs and, and we say, I need my job to fill me, to give me meaning, to give me purpose. Fill me. We, we look at our money and we say, I need, I need my money to fill me. St- I need to stuff myself with money. We look at our relationships and I say, I need to find purpose and value in relationship. Fill me. Stuff myself with that. We look at our stuff our actual stuff, and we, we say this, fill me with stuff because that's going to give me meaning and value. We look at, we look at social media and we, we want to post things where people will validate us, where people will, will say, oh, your, your life is so hard, you deserve this, or blah, blah, blah. We, we say, fill me, give me purpose, meaning, value, when in reality we shouldn't be holding up our life to those things and saying, fill me. We should be holding them up to God and saying, fill me, God so that then I can pour into others. That's the attitude of Christ. That's the example that he gave us to follow. And and that's what will be a difference maker. Being funnels, this is going to be a a difference maker in, in, in our homes, in our jobs, in our relationships, in our church, in our families. And it'll be a difference maker in you because you'll be living how you were created to live. In reading uh, for today and just studying different commentaries, one commentary mentioned when it says that Jesus emptied himself, taking the very nature of a, of a servant. The, the, I love what it said. It says it, it's not that, that God traded, Jesus traded God for becoming a servant, but it was, he was saying that, that basically what Jesus did was he added that to who he was, that he was fully God, But he also said, you know what? I'm going to add being a a servant. And see, here's the deal. Stuffed living, it has no more room to add add one more thing, to add something else. And what's sad is is we we miss God. We miss the things of God. We miss the opportunities of God, all because we're too afraid to empty ourselves of the stuff that really doesn't matter, but it's, it's, it's what the world says matters. You see, Jesus took on, he added, if anyone could have said, you know what, I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy running the world. I'm too busy running the universe. I'm too busy doing all these other things, but Jesus wasn't too busy because Jesus wasn't about himself. He wasn't stuffed living he was funnel living and he said i'm going to take on the very nature of a servant because i know god's going to use that to make an impact and to change lives and how many of us are so stuffed that we say i can't i can't eat another bite or i can't add another thing to my calendar i can't do it but what are we stuffing ourselves with Have we stuffed our calendars? Have we stuffed our families? Have we stuffed our homes? Have we stuffed uh, the things that we consume? uh, Have we stuffed it with things that just don't matter? Last thing there, funnel living means that you are less demanding and that 
there's more pointing people to Christ. So you're less demanding, making demands, and more pointing people to Christ. At verse 9, it says this, and there in Philippians, it says, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. He's talking about Jesus. But I want you to notice them. Did you notice who did the exalting? Did Jesus do the exalting? No. Jesus did it. He humbled himself. God was the one that exalted him. And I think that we get guilty sometimes of exalting ourselves. We're, we're trying to exalt our name. We're trying to extol our agendas. We're trying to magnify our accomplishments. We're trying uh, to glorify our lives. We want to be the show. We want to be the show. We want to be noticed. We want to be praised. <clears throat> we want to be honored. We want to be in charge. We want, we want to control. We want And that's, that's stuff living. We, we want. That's fence living. That's not funnel living. Funnel living doesn't say, look, look at me. Funnel living points people to God and says, look, look at him. If you know anything uh, about the New Testament, you'll remember a character named John the Baptist. He was Jesus' cousin. And John the Baptist, um, his whole life, his whole life was about preparing the way for Jesus. He wasn't trying to prepare the way for John, trying to prepare the way for himself. He was, all he was doing was getting ready for Jesus, getting people ready for Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, the first thing that he did, the first thing that he said, he said, look, look. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If John the Baptist was a fence guy, he would have said, oh, pay attention, pay attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But he didn't. He said, look. If you're looking at me, you're looking at the wrong person. Behold, Jesus. Colossians 3.12 says, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That sounds like a very expensive and troubling wardrobe. So if I went into your closet, right here, let's talk about, let's say in closet, but I mean your heart. If I went into your closet today, because by the way, those are all characteristics of, of funnel living, would I see compassion? Would I see kindness? Would I see humility, gentleness, and patience? Or, if we opened up your closet, would we see indifference? Would we see selfishness, anger, a lot of demanding, see a lot of frustration? God says as his people that our wardrobe has to look a whole lot different than what the world wears. Indifferent people, when, they're, when you're wearing indifference, you just want people to, to leave you alone. Selfish people, when you're wearing selfishness, then you just want your own way. Angry people, when you're wearing anger, um, you just want people to get out of your way. Demanding, when you've got on the demanding jacket, then you want people just to serve you, just to be about you. Frustrated people, when you've got that jacket on, all you want is you want everyone else to change because it's not, none of it is, none of it is you. Basically, it boils down to this. Do you want to be God or are you going to let God be God? in your life that'll, that'll determine what wardrobe you wear that'll determine whether you put on uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience but if you're going to be God then you're going to put on something completely different something that completely clashes with those things Matthew 5.16 says in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven Matthew 5, 16, and verse 11 in chapter 2 of Philippians, they have the exact same idea. And the idea is that all glory goes to God the Father. Our lives, I don't know if you know this, but our lives were meant to make much of Jesus. Our lives were never meant to, 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 to make much of ourselves. We, we are, think of yourself as a backstage hand. Jesus is the star of the show. We point the spotlight on, on him. Too many of us are struggling to try to kind of get in the spotlight. We're trying to come up from the back, and we want to be up front. But we, we wouldn't say that. We wouldn't actually say that, like, hey, I want to be the star of the show. 
But we, we act like that. We, we post things, like I said earlier, that want people to, we kind of want people to, oh, you know, poor you, you're good, you're the best, your family looks great, your life is so hard, you're wonderful. That's trying to be in the spotlight. Or, or maybe we, we do things so that people will notice. Did you see me? You see me? You see me what I'm doing here at church? Did you catch that? Or look, 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 I'm here, I'm, I'm here. We want, we want to be noticed. Or we, we, uh, we, point, we point out how the world is bad, but we're so good, and yay, you know, yay, you're, you're, you're good. And, and we want to be noticed. We put on a big show, ultimately, because we, we just want people to notice us. And Jesus said, I'm humbling myself because I want people to notice my Father in heaven. Jesus didn't exalt himself. Matter of fact, he did the exact opposite. He humbled himself and he died. And notice what the scripture says, even death on a cross. In other words, he didn't just die. He was tortured. He was murdered. He was humiliated. Jesus didn't exalt himself. God exalted him. And God calls us to shine our lights so that others will see the Father. Fence living says, follow me. Funnel living says, follow him. So if you want to be like Christ, then, then one of the best things that you can do to be like Christ is to give. To give. Jesus gives. He gives love. Jesus gives forgiveness. Jesus gives mercy. Jesus gives grace. Jesus gives life. He, gives, he, he gave his life. Fence people don't give. They, they really take. And, but funnel people remember that they are God's conduit to a lost and hurting world. Funnel people are God's conduit to, to, to love other believers. They're God's conduit to bless others with their time, uh, to bless others with our talents, to b- bless others with our, our money, our treasure, our resources. Funnel people are, are, are frustrated with life being stuffed. And they do they do something about it. They don't want a stuffed calendar. They don't want a stuffed ego. They don't want a stuffed social media presence. They don't want a bunch of, they don't want to be stuffed with self-pity. They don't want to be stuffed with, with, with negative humility that says, I'm just, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. No, what funnel people say, I want Christ to use me. I want Christ to use my calendar. I want Christ to use my my family i want christ to use my marriage i want christ to use me in high school and middle school i want christ to use me at my job i want christ to use me at my church i want christ to use me god fill me up but a lot of us stop there there can't be a period at the end of that sentence there has to be a comma god fill me up comma so that i can pour out onto others we don't need fences we need funnels